Welcome into the Lions 24-7 podcast, our second episode of the week. We had mentioned we were going to be getting back to Beaver Stadium this week to hear from James Franklin, new special teams coordinator, and essentially the entire 2023 class that came to campus last year. That all happened. It all took place. Bunch of coverage at Lions247.com. We're going to get into a lot of those details from our discussions uh, with those younger members of the roster, what we heard from James Franklin, including some feedback early on a few different transfer pickups. But we got to begin this particular episode on Thursday with a bit of breaking news as a roster update came through for Penn State here on Thursday, and, and it brought some significant changes. And, and we have to start at the top, all Big Ten linebacker Abdul Carter, an all Big Ten selection, not just last year as a sophomore, but the year before and an All-American freshman. He is now going to be playing defensive end, according to the roster update. We've got a few other things to get to. That is clearly the number one priority for this discussion. And to get into it, we talk with Mark Brennan and Daniel Gallon. Both of these guys were with me at Beaver Stadium on Tuesday. As I said, we'll get into those details in a bit. But, Mark, Abdul Carter, widely considered maybe the, the top returning linebacker in this conference it's a very talented conference, too. Uh, when you go out and you become a freshman All-American and then you follow it up with first-team All-Big Ten honors as a sophomore, you tend to get that kind of clout. And yet, here we see now defensive end next to his name on the roster. There's some dynamics in this with the new defensive coordinator and Tom Allen. We'll talk about the positional impact at both linebacker and defensive end, but focusing on the player himself, the six foot three, 250-pound rising junior. What do you make of this move, Mark? Well, you know, one thing I think if you could have an athlete like Abdul Carter become mo a more effective pass rusher, that would be really big for Penn for the Penn State defense. You look at the stats last year and through I think it was eight games, he had one sack, you know, finishes with four point five. Uh, but, you know, can you get more out of a guy that's that sort of sort of dynamic athlete, especially given that you're losing Chop Robinson and Adisa Isaac, who, you know, by all accounts, Adisa Isaac is a guy who's really shooting up the uh, NFL draft uh, mocks. So I wonder if this is just not a way to get another one of these dynamic athletes, a pass rusher into a position. And the other thing is, is, you know, you kind of go through and you look at what Tom Allen has done as a, as a defensive coach and they've had that hybrid type linebacker defensive end position. I think he called it the bull. I would be surprised if Penn state labels anything like that. So maybe they're just going to call it defensive end and, and be more uh, of kind of a hybrid position. You know, it, it, it would have been nice had we known this before, uh, having the opportunity to talk to James Franklin earlier this week. But, you know, in, in the coming weeks, we'll try to get the lowdown on this. This literally just happened, you know, as we're taping this thing uh, Thursday. Tyler, you got you guys, you and Daniel uncovered this, um, you know, mere hours ago. So we're still kind of sorting through it. But again, I think you're looking at trying to get a dy dynamic athlete where he can make more of an impact getting to the quarterback. We know how big that is in college football. It was an interesting morning here. I uh, saw the announcement from Anthony Poindexter that his competitor of the day in the safety room was Lamont Payne. And we'll talk about Payne's transition to safety in a bit from cornerback. But I reached out and said, OK, he's listed at cornerback on the roster, but he's getting accolades from the safeties coach. Does he have a new home? Because we had known for a long time that Lamont Wade was under consideration to end up at safety despite being a cornerback in 2023. That was confirmed and that was going to be updated on the roster. Lo and behold, it wasn't the only roster update and it certainly wasn't the headliner. As, as we continue to focus on Abdul Carter, Daniel, this is a guy who had 11 sacks his first couple seasons. He had six and a half as a freshman, which led all freshmen during the regular season, regardless of position, in across the FBS in 2022. Last year, as Mark referenced, we were all wondering where the sack production was for, for a long stretch of the season, a couple months. He gets three and a half sacks down the stretch. He had two sacks against Michigan State in that regular season finale. And you're thinking, OK, he's up to his old tricks we got to recalibrate a little bit here, but it's very much different, I would say, than, than Micah Parsons, who didn't really get to show off his prowess as a pass rusher. You know, a guy who was six foot three, 245 pound range on campus, not too far off from Abdul Carter, where he is right now. Um, but he had one and a half sacks as a freshman, ballooned up to five as a sophomore. And I think we were all anticipating he would be more of a presence on the edge and maybe more of a hybrid type as a junior. He opted out with, with the entire situation in COVID. Now we know what he can do as a pass rusher, though. I mean, he's one of the best to do it in the NFL. What do you make of Penn State being proactive with Abdul Carter and giving him an opportunity to not just impact the position of need, but he could really showcase some things that if Micah Parsons had been able to show in college, there's no way he's fallen out of the top 10 a few years back. 
Yeah, I mean, I think it kind of goes back to other things that that we've heard too when when you talk about guys kind of growing up and growing into different positions where you'll have safety that'll grow into a linebacker and then you can have a linebacker that can grow into a defensive end. And so I, I think that you look at Abdul Carter and, and he's got those traits. And I, I think that you know, that type of athleticism, I mean, we, we've seen that he can do some things uh, in coverage in terms of pass breakups, uh, bringing, bringing ball carriers down and forcing fumbles. Um, but I do think that he's the type of athlete where if you get him coming off the edge over and over again, um, I, I think that that's something that you really want to use. And then on top of that, he'll have that linebacker background. So in Tom Allen's system, if there are linebacker responsibilities um, or if those, I mean, even under Manny Diaz last year, we saw Adis Isaac dropping back in, in different looks. And and so you know, with Abdul Carter having that linebacker background, I, I think that and that's something too that that he might be able to excel at some of those more hybrid things depending on the situation depending on the scheme um but i, I think it's a really interesting move um you know when we get out there for for spring ball uh, it's going to be interesting Ab- abdul's always been one of the more imposing players um when we've seen him out there but now we're going to see him going through drills with those defensive tackles with those defensive ends and it'll be interesting to see what he looks like physically in that group um, and then once we, I, I think we saw him take some pass rushing reps over the course of last year too. But, you know, if we do get a look at, at some one-on-ones and stuff like that, I think that'll be pretty cool to see and give us a bit of a, a measuring stick uh, from, from where this move is right now. And let's be realistic. This is news today, but this has been a position that has been kind of bounced around with Abdul Carter going back to his high school career. It was discussed very much as a potential defensive end coming to a college campus. And of course, he got his start at linebacker and he ran with it in a big way in 2022. And he's a guy who, you know, that big frame, 250 pounds, you can see certainly carries it, but he's had that ability to show range at the linebacker position. And now concentrating maybe closer to the line of scrimmage here, I'm curious because Tom Allen told us a few days before Christmas uh, when him and Abdul Carter got together in the Penn State weight room for the first time and, and had a little interaction. He said, we had a tough time blocking you in Indiana. Now I have to try and find ways to make you unblockable. That's the way that Tom Allen said it. And I want to go back to something you referenced, Mark, and that's that within the structure in Indiana. And we have to be really realistic about this, too. He's in he's coming over to what was in a lot of metrics, the number one defense, not just in the Big Ten, but nationally. And there's a lot of talent that he could have only wished to hoped and dreamed for in Bloomington. And James Franklin has a decade on campus and has a way that he wants things run defensively. So we're not quite sure how many things carry over from Indiana to Penn State, but typically you'd see a 4-2-5 schematically defensively. And that included a couple hybrid positions. We had Jared Kelly, Indiana's uh, beat reporter within the 24-7 Sports Network, on with us shortly after Tom Allen was hired here on the podcast. And he did a nice job breaking down that it's a 4-2-5, but one of those fifth guys at the defensive back position is more of a hybrid linebacker defensive back. That's not all too that f- unfamiliar from what we've seen with Penn State in that Sam position. We've seen safeties move to linebacker. We're going to talk about that again in a second. Uh, but there's also that bull position that they ran, and, and that's what you're talking about, Mark, which which really m- more fits Abdul Carter to a T. The edge, outside uh, outside edge rusher, guy who's going to be able to stand up, maybe provide some coverage downfield. And that essentially, to me, is a money position in the game of football. You look at that the way this game is going and who's getting paid big bucks, that edge rusher role. I mean, we, we at 24-7 Sports, we don't even rank defensive ends and defensive tackles anymore. We rank edge defenders, and that can end up being the stand-up linebackers in college. It can end up being hand-in-the-dirt defensive ends in college. And then we rank interior defensive linemen. So there has been kind of that that divide and, and growth at the position uh, when you look at the different levels of football. And so, Mark, when you review what they have on the edge now and the, the thought process of adding Abdul Carter to a group that's led by five-star, former five-star Denai Dennis Sutton, who got a few starts with Chop Robinson sideline, you got fifth-year experienced guys in Zariah Fisher, who's been having a great winter workout schedule, and Amin Vanover. You got a sixth-year guy that we just don't know much about at this point, and Smith Vilbert. He hasn't played a regular season game since 2021, but the size is there, and we've seen it flash in a bowl game in the past. And then, of course, Jameel Lyons, year two on campus, burned red shirt last year, and a lot of us were eyeing him up to maybe make a shot at a starting role in year two on campus, despite some of the veterans throwing a guy like Joseph Mapoye, Mason Robinson, who are trying to get their feet underneath them here in year two. And you like the depth at this spot, despite losing two NFL talents. 
Mark, what do you make of, of, of how this is all going to work out for Dion Barnes? Because there's a lot of names to sift through. And now throwing Abdul Carter into the conversation gives you a lot of options. Yeah, the more the merrier, right? I mean, I think, you know, Denai really is the one guy who I think established himself. He was essentially a starter last year. But, you know, beyond that, um, you know, you have guys who have been productive in spots. I mean, Vanover, Zariah Fisher, I think has gotten better and better throughout his career. Uh, again, you throw uh, Jameel Lyons, I think has an unbelievable upside, but I'm sure they're, they're looking at this as, uh, you know, this is probably going to be the last year for Abdul Carter, right? And how do you possibly get the most out of him? So whatever you have at defensive end there, um, you, you know, if you think you're going to be able to get more out of an Abdul Carter as a starter, and I don't think they do this unless he's going to be a starter. I mean, it, it, that would be, I, I know they're going to, what they're, what James Franklin is going to say is there's competition for every position, but if healthy, you know, I would bet dollars to donuts that, that, that Abdul Carter is going to be a starter at this position, whatever, whatever they're going to call it. So yeah, I think the more the merrier, I think the, the bigger question, Tyler is, how does this impact the linebacker group? Because there, we're talking about an abundance of riches at defensive end, in my view, even losing the two guys who are going to be pretty high NFL draft picks. But when you start looking at the linebacker positions, you know, all of a sudden, you have two veterans there at the mic. And after that, you know, you take Abdul Carter out of the mix. I don't want – you have Dom DeLuca as well, I mean, playing over to Sam. I don't want to be down on him because when he's been in there, you know, he's done a nice job for a former walk-on. But you just don't see that level of depth. I know we're going to talk about Tony Rojas a little bit later, but how much experience is there? So that's where, where, where I see the impact on the defensive line. You know, you have a lot of talent there, but I wonder the trickle down backward, how is this going to impact the linebacker, linebacker positions? Yeah, there's a couple of those class of 2023 players that we promised we'd get into at the linebacker spot. Tony Rojas, Kavion Keys, also Tamir Robinson, of course. And, and when we focus on the, this, this linebacker spot now with Abdul Carter, out of that equation, at least for this conversation, Daniel, you talk about the box positions. So Don DeLuca, typically going to be a guy who's outside, uh, you know, whether you want to call it that hybrid position that they ran in Indiana, the same position that we've become accustomed to that Curtis Jacobs started at. Jonathan Sutherland previously played at a former safety himself. Tyrese Mills has made the move over from safety to linebacker. He's a guy who came to campus after being a Lackawanna defensive back and then played a little bit of linebacker in 2022, suffered a season-ending injury that August, resurfaced last year at safety again. But we noted down in Atlanta before the Peach Bowl that, that he was working with the linebacker group, and lo and behold, he's back with the linebackers now. He's got eligibility through next year, but Tyrese Mills now, a couple years on campus, year three on campus now, second position change, significant injury. You want to see what comes out of this for him. But Sam's a spot where they could use, or the outside position is a spot where they could use some fortification. Tony Ross can maybe contribute there. Maybe you could start there, depending on how they view him in this linebacker unit. But in the box, because that's where Abdul Carter certainly was, Guys like Keon Wiley, Kavion Keys, uh, they're starting to become names that are more integral to what this defense wants to do. Tamir, too. Tamir Robinson mm -hmm. as well, yes. Yeah, I mean, I think that when you look, when you talk about moving Abdul Carter out of that room, um, I think it kind of it opens things up a little bit um, in, in terms of competition and, and gives these younger guys, I think, a lot more of an opportunity. I, I know that uh, you talk about, you know, James Franklin says, like Mark mentioned, there's there's always competition. Everything's up for grabs. But you know, realistically, you know, coming into this year, Abdul Carter, Kobe King, I'd say both of them were entrenched at those spots. So you were just looking at the Sam and with Tom Allen coming in, you know, how does that position look different? Um, and so I think that you know, moving Abdul Carter down to the defensive end, I think that it fortifies your depth there. Um, I, I put it on the board, but last year they – had a pretty nice five-man rotation. You lose two of those guys. Jameel Lyons bumps up into that group. Now Abdul Carter's in that group with Dennis Sutton, Fisher, uh, Vanover. So you're back to five there. Um, and then you look at linebacker, and now you have a chance for guys like Tony Rojas to get on the field. You know, Kavion Keys is someone who there's, I think, a, a bunch of buzz about. Um, yes. There's a lot of excitement uh, for someone who didn't burn his red shirt last year, who, who didn't have a, you know, a big role last year. So, um, and then Tamia Robinson is someone who, you know, whenever you'd look at that white, that linebacker group during warmups or you know, the couple snaps you got here and there, you'd see him on the field and he's someone that 
really kind of took your attention uh, with, with his build, with his size, with his frame. And so I, I think that yeah, I think that it is, um, you know, kind of a, it'll be interesting because there's not a lot of experience there. Some of these guys are going to have to take take a leap um, to really establish themselves. But I do think that having, you know, opening things up a little bit more, uh, you know, not just having the Sam, having guys competing to be the will to play in the box, um, I, I think is going to be a pretty interesting dynamic um, and is going to allow some guys to, to really show what they can do. KB on keys, I think, is a little lost in the shuffle because he came to campus in be, like with Abdul Carter and right before uh, Tony Rojas. And it's kind of like, OK, well, how does he fit in, in in this whole conversation? He redshirted a couple of years ago last year, took on a, a, a larger role, but still a relatively reserved role at the linebacker spot. But Keyes is a guy who's really come a long way physically, and I know they like where he's at mentally here in year three. Or, I'm sorry, Keon like you. Wiley. This, yeah. you know, saying these two names <laughs> among each other for the rest of the year is going to be difficult. But that's Keon Wiley. And then Kavion Keys. we'll get to a little bit later here on the episode because he's part of that rundown we're going to do with this 2023 class. But keeping the focus on the defensive side of things here, I just want to know at the front seven, we're talking about end, we're talking about linebacker. If you missed it, we had Devon Ellis on with us uh, on on Monday on our on our podcast, and he had a lot to say about that defensive tackle room, which didn't lose a single person. Brings back Alonzo Ford, who was an old Dominion transfer, and brings in a really big freshman class. So that is an area that is very well fortified. You're not really having to replace parts or scramble around there. But in the secondary, really a lot of movement today at safety. We talked about Tyrese Mills jumping over to linebacker once again after spending time in that safety room. And we've got another one on the move in Makai Flowers. He's actually going across the field to the other side of the football, now at wide receiver. Flowers is a guy who flashed two-way power five prospect material in the state of Pennsylvania during his high school career. He had almost 2,000 receiving yards as an upperclassman. He had 50-plus catches in each of his three final high school seasons. So he is very comfortable on that side of the ball, and he was very much considered on that side of the ball coming out of high school as a top 24-7 prospect. A couple of years at the safety spot, burned red shirt in 2022, uh, had limited action primarily on special teams last year, focused on safety. And now, Mark, we see him do something that, that you know, we, we've seen it not work out quite as well for, for past uh, examples here in recent memory. Marquise Wilson going from cornerback to wide receiver. He ultimately circled back to cornerback before transferring. And then we saw Christian Driver make the move from cornerback to wide receiver after his first year on campus. He caught one pass last year. He's now elsewhere in the Big Ten as a Minnesota transfer pickup. So we'll see if they have more success here with Flowers, who, as I said, has a track record on offense. This is interesting, though, Mark. They're up to 13 scholarship receivers on this current roster. They're going to add Peter uh, Peter Gonzalez and Tysir Denmark to that group in the summer. That does include Josiah Brown, who's going to be sidelined this, sp this spring. There's a lot of bodies, and five of them on scholarship are from within that 2022 class. You swap out a uh, driver for Makai Flowers, and you've still got Tyler Johnson, Anthony Ivey, Omari Evans, and Caden Saunders, and a lot to figure out. Yeah, you have 13 scholarship players, and you have 25 questions about who's going to be what over there. I mean, and I think that's why you go ahead and do this, because, you know, let's face it, uh, you know, outside of Harrison Wallace late, and I think you're probably going to be able to expect some consistency out of Julian Fleming. Uh, you know, the, at, at last check, Keandre Lambert-Smith was barely used in the bowl game. And Amari Evans, they obviously couldn't figure out what the hell to do with him last year. You know, the, the, even after a coordinator change, he had one big game. And then so I think you juxtapose that to what they have at safety. And at safety, you have questions answered. I mean, you have Jalen Reed and you have KJ Winston. And then for depth, you're looking at Zaki Wheatley and King Mack with Tyrese uh, Mills moving over. So I just think you're so solid there, even though there's not 13 scholarship safeties, that you're at the position now. And I think this is sending a little bit of a message that they're looking for playmakers at wideout, however they could get them. And if that means moving somebody from defense who didn't figure – to be really in, in with all due respect um, to Makai, I mean, as we projected, as we look, looked ahead, he could have proven us wrong, but I don't think barring injury, he was going to crack that too deep. Uh, here's an opportunity for him to go over and, and maybe show some things that maybe other players weren't. So I think that's more of a reflection of 
how strong they are at safety, uh, well, an equal reflection of how strong they are at safety and how many questions there are at wide receiver. Yeah, returning three of the top four safeties. You got guys like King Mack and Dakari Nelson trying to make their move at that position as well. And so, so many names. And we're adding another to the list, that receiver, to, to figure things out here over the course of the spring. It's a big semester for that room in general. We've said time and time again, don't expect that room to stay intact coming out of spring ball. That's just the way college football works. There's going to be some attrition, I think, before those two freshmen come on board. But it's a big year for Makai Flowers and his college football career. Now a redshirt sophomore working at a new position. Uh, and, and you know, that's another one where we talked about. There's a history of, is he a receiver? Is he a defensive back coming out of high school? Well, there was a history with Lamont Payne. Is he a safety? Is he a cornerback? He was on the podcast with us shortly before his enrollment last winter and said he his comfort level was higher at cornerback, but he had discussed both positions with Penn State staff, was essentially going to enroll knowing that he could have two potential paths to playing time. Year one at the cornerback spot, he got into two games, preserved that red shirt. Year two, he'll be getting familiar with the safety room now. And this is basically falling in line with the Zaki Wheatley path that we witnessed a couple of years ago. Daniel Gowan, when he came to town, red shirted as a cornerback, gained some of those coverage skills. They love to put these guys on an island their first year on campus, see how they can handle that. And then he moves over to safety. We saw Keaton Ellis take, uh, take that similar route as well. It took him a little bit longer to, to make that move in his career, but What's your initial reaction? Because Lamont Payne, one thing I'll say, every time we get eyes in this defensive backfield, he is one of the longer, rangier bodies out there. Yeah, I, I think that he kind of fits that that mold, uh, the the longer, rangier guy, as as you described. And I, I I talked to him on Tuesday, and I asked him about his uh, you know that position flexibility specifically, and and where he was at it. And you know, he was kind of noncommittal uh, at the time. He just said that he was open. Um, and for him, it was about getting that path to playing time. Um, you know, he said which whichever way was was easiest and that can get him on the field earliest. That's the direction that he wanted to go. Uh, you look at that cornerback room and you added Jalen Kimber and AJ Harris um, and then freshmen coming in like John Mitchell, Mitchell and Antoine Belgrave shorter. Um, you know, that's a lot of competition in that room. You look at the safeties and you just subtracted two. Um, with Tyrese Mills and and Makai Flowers changing spots. And yeah, I think that it makes sense. You know, Payne's only going to be a second year player. Um, so he's not, you know, as far along in development at one position like some other players have been when when trying to switch spots. So he's gonna have time. Um, you know, even though he said that he wanted to go wherever would get him on the field earliest, you know, he's not going to be pressed into action um before he needs to be because of what's ahead of him. So I, I think that it, it helps fortify stuff as you kind of are shuffling pieces around. Um, I, I think in terms of, you know, moving flowers and, and mills uh, away from the safety spot, I think one thing too is you look at the job that Jalen Reed and KJ Winston did last year in terms of really establish them, establishing themselves as the safeties. You know, in Manny Diaz's first year, you saw those four guys really rotate through with, Wheatley and Ellis um, with, uh, or not, yeah, Wheatley and Ellis with, with Tig Brown and um, and Jalen Reed. And la so you're kind of like, oh, like they're going four deep regularly. And that really wasn't the case last year. So I, I think that that kind of allows you to, to move guys around too when you know who the two, you know, are going to be out there on a consistent basis where you don't need to worry about, um, you know, playing four guys a bunch of snaps every week and have the depth ready. Um, to, to backfill that. So uh, I just think that this is the time to make these experiments to, to move guys around. And I think with Lamont Payne, um, you're keeping him in that backfield and I think you're still going to give him a chance to develop. And, you know, you really do like length at that safety spot. So you know, we'll, we'll see what that looks like. I really like the, the coverage skills that I think are at your disposal in that safety room beyond that starting pair. We know Zaki Wheatley's uh, have been counted on as a as a number two safety for, for a while now, last couple of years. Don't expect his role to go anywhere. It, maybe that gets bigger. But as you've mentioned, those two starters did really good to, to clamp things down. But you got King Mack, who's probably going to play quite a bit in the slot coverage this year. He, he certainly could be a cornerback if he wanted to be or if Penn State wanted him to be. And then you've got Wheatley, who I just mentioned, former cornerback, 
You've got Lamont Payne, former cornerback. And then you've got uh, Dakari Nelson roaming around looking like a big dude, and we're still trying to wrap our heads around what he's going to be for this defense. But uh, just an update there as, as we work our way through. One more thing. Can we go back to the Abdul Carter going to defensive end conversation? Because last no. year we saw – No, you're done. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> last year we saw – Abdul or uh, Chop Robinson go play a little bit of interior role and then deny Dennis Sutton and Adiza Isaac rush off the edge. I mean, this starts to give you a lot of different equations and formulas you can come up for getting to the quarterback. If you're picturing Abdul Carter on the perimeter, maybe throw a Zariah Fisher or Jamil Lyons and, and some of their explosive speed rush off the edge on the other side and just put it out there. Deny Dennis Sutton is 270 pounds now. I mean, thoughts on thoughts on any of this, Mark? Uh, I don't think he, you know what, if you look at him, what do they have him listed at height wise? I mean, I, I? yeah, he's six foot five, two seventy, and, and, and he's, he's not is, six, five. He is not. So he's taller than six, five. <laughs> I am telling you, I am telling you that that man is taller than six foot five. I'll I, mean, believe he, I bet you he's closer to six foot seven. And I think he's big enough to carry that weight. I really do. So no. I would not read anything into that, especially given what they have at defensive tackle. I don't know that they have a superstar at defensive tackle, but I think they have a really nice rotation of players. So hold I don't on, hold, hold on, miscommunication. You're talking about me saying permanent move. I'm talking about Chop Robinson moving inside for a down or two on obvious pass downs. I'm oh, about oh okay. Minnesota. I thought you were getting at deny way. No, 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 no. I'm talking about your ability to run that package. And again, absolutely. You yeah, I mean, yeah. And, and you're going from Chop Robinson, who was certainly undersized at, what, 240, 255, whatever he ended up being. They're similar athletes. I mean, similar – I don't know that – Much that bigger Ab frame. Yeah, I don't know that Abdul has that that quick first step. I mean, because that's kind of elite. And that's not a knock on Abdul, because I think when you're looking at a guy like Chop, you're looking at something special. I'm sorry. I thought when you were saying how big Denai is, I, th I thought maybe you were indicating that maybe there was a move for him – kind of moving inside but no i'm just i'm picturing i agree with you yeah some speed off the edge and denied then a sudden that's six foot seven as you say we'll call him six foot five and a half for now and 270 <laughs> pounds and some speed off the edge sure. you throw in what they've got at linebacker with the speed there and, and i mean what they got across the field this is just it's it's a lot of fun i think it's important for penn state when you have the depth that they do on defense, we said this last year, how do you find your best 11 for different circumstances? And they have an advantage. And think about where Tom Allen's coming from, a roster that was getting routinely gutted by the transfer portal and guys going to other Power 5 programs. Now he's got this abundance of options at all three levels and the mind to work with it. It's exciting stuff. I mean, it's kind of a refreshing take on this Penn State defense, not necessarily a conversation I thought we'd be having at this stage of the calendar year. Yeah, he has his. Own, he's going to have his own style, but he he would be wise to to look at the way that Manny Diaz got creative and did things, and he will. I mean, he's not. I, I don't think he's some sort of egomaniac who's going to say it's my way or the highway. I mean, he's going to look at what was effective at Penn State last year, what's been effective for him, and I think you, you're going to have you know some sort of meeting in the middle or wherever it may be. But yeah, I mean, that's what I thought the beauty of Manny Diaz was is that he found ways to best utilize guys. I mean, w when you were looking at Johnny Dixon having as many sacks as Abdul Carter, you know, what's that telling you? That's telling you this guy isn't afraid to, to rush anybody or, or play to anybody's strength and put them anywhere on the field. And that's what I love about it. So, yeah, absolutely. And I think that's part of what this whole thing with Abdul is about is giving him the ability – to play all over the place. I mean, I hate the Dallas Cowboys, but if you look at what they do with Micah Parsons, I mean, he's not always lining up as a rush defensive end. I mean, sometimes he'll be standing up. Sometimes he'll drop back into coverage. And I think that's what people are trying to figure out the best way to utilize these unbelievable athletes. And I think Abdul Carter kind of falls into that, that, that category. Yeah, positionless uh, basketball has become a big topic. I think we're starting to see positionless defense uh, is start to really take off across all levels of football. And Penn State has the bodies and athleticism to really come up with some new things. Circling back to Tuesday, we had a chance to go face-to-face uh, -face with James Franklin in the Beaver Stadium media room for the first time in 2024. It was our first press conference setting with Franklin since the Peach Bowl postgame in Atlanta. Obviously, a lot has changed. There's been about... 25 guys added to the roster, a bunch of guys removed from the roster, and three new coordinators trying to settle in. When we did hear from James, he said two priorities stand out at this stage of the year. One, getting everyone on the same page with the three new coordinators to eliminate a need to reteach things when they get on the field this spring and ultimately into preseason camp. 
And then two, trying to figure out where the depth chart stands. And I, I suppose some of this roster movement is a byproduct of that. But Franklin discussed a lot of depth that he sees and he thinks it's going to result not just in a high quality spring, but listeners out there were like this. He's expecting a very high quality spring game. And there's been years where Franklin has forewarned us not to expect a high quality spring game because of some depth issues. Uh, he's excited about the, the depth across the field. Daniel, just uh, initial takeaways before we get into some of the transfer breakdowns on what we heard from James. There's never enough time at this point in the year because we have so many questions and it was a half hour window. And there were some questions that didn't necessarily help move the meter towards learning things about this <laughs> team. But what, what did you come away maybe learning yourself? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that what James Franklin talked about in terms of the bringing the coordinators in and and trying to to figure out, you know, how to, you know, make it so, like you said, they don't have to reteach a lot of things in the spring. Um, it, it sounded like that they're trying to maybe marry some of the terminology um, so that you know guys don't have to learn a completely new language. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, especially on the defensive side of the ball, that. Um, Franklin has talked about before um, in terms of hiring Manny Diaz and then hiring Tom Allen um, in terms of looking for coaches that run a scheme that the personnel that they already have can fit in um, so that you're not you know, moving all these guys around that you know, even though the coaching change, you make a coaching change that the guys will have similar roles to what they had before. Um, so I thought that was that was interesting. I mean, that's going to be really, um, I think, key on the offensive side of the ball, um, because especially when you look at you know the passing game, uh, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done there. So what is that uh, exactly going to look like? But you know, I thought that at this point in the year, um, you know, James Franklin seemed, you know, pretty, you know, I think, you know, I think felt like he's looking forward to it. Um, that you know, he knows that there's a lot of work that they have to do between now and spring ball so that they can really get things clicking on all cylinders. But um, it does seem like that that he is looking forward to it with this group that he has. And you know, like you said, Tyler, it's a competitive spring game. Uh, I think that that's something that you know, we can all kind of you know note uh, that they're going to have bodies, that they're going to have uh, you know a lot of guys out there getting work, and that's something that I think can only be good for this team. Yeah, people remember, we, not only did we not have a spring game there because of COVID, but when they got back, there weren't enough offensive linemen to really put together a true scrimmage kind of situation. So a little bit starved. We got back on the right track last year. It sounds like it's going to be an exciting uh, exciting afternoon, April 13th, as exciting as it can be for practice number 15 of the spring practice schedule. Mark, we did hear about a few transfers who, who made their move to campus in January. Uh, you asked about one of them, and and, and uh, actually, you were going to ask about Julian Fleming, and I think he was asked about prior to that, and James went, went on a bit. But let's go with Fleming because he is certainly the most notable. He's the one that we're projecting in the starting lineup first out of this group uh, from trans from the transfer portal. Um, and he's somebody that has a really interesting background with James Franklin. You and I were seeing it firsthand during yeah. various recruiting uh, events and various prospect camps. And sometimes it seemed really good, the relationship, and it seemed like inevitable that Julian Fleming was going to sign with Penn State. Other times it was looking pretty icy and it was hard to figure out if James Franklin and James and and and, and uh, Julian Fleming were, were you know, going to be able to circle back with each other. And, and they ultimately did. And J Julian Fleming, somebody told us before he got to campus was that he picked up pretty fast that the relationships were still there with Franklin, with other members of the staff who were there. And he feels like from his perspective, he sees how much those people have grown. He kind of referenced James Franklin and how he's progressed as a person. And he says, I'd imagine they see me the same way. Took four or five years longer than what Penn State would have preferred, but he is here. And it sounds like before we get to him getting targeted in Big Ten games from Drew Aller, the influence in the locker room, the influence in that receiver room specifically, the ball is beginning to roll. Uh, and we're hearing that from some tangible sources at this stage. Yeah, you know, one of the, the different things now about college football, and this is the case with Fleming and with Nolan Rucci, is, you know, as a coach, you may get a second bite at that apple at some point, you know, so so don't burn bridges. I'm going to use as many cliches as I can here. Uh, but but in all honesty, um, we saw the way that went, and James told us, he said, you know, there were times when when they thought they had Julian Fleming. And, you know, it would be really easy, especially when he goes to one of your arch rivals to kind of say, you know, that's it. We're done with this guy. But I think wisely you don't do that, especially now. I mean, now that it's now we are where we are with the transfer portal and he didn't do it. 
uh, I think ends up working out well for Penn State. But yeah, I mean, we saw this situation where, it, I mean, we're there and and James is talking to the mom and the grandfather and, you know, all these different people. And uh, it was just interesting to see. But with respect to the the impact in that room, you know, we we have heard from from some of the players uh, when the intern went out to the bowling event recently about, you know, how he's kind of emerging as a leader. But the one thing Franklin said that I liked is that the first thing Julian or what Julian Fleming didn't do is talk a lot. Initially, he came in and kept his yap shut and kind of gauged what the situation was. I think that's tremendous because, listen, everybody understands that the program that Penn State is measured against is Ohio State. And Penn State has been unable to get over that hump. And it would be really easy for a player from that program to come in and think like he act like he knows everything. You know, we're the program that that's been succeeding. We're the program that's beaten you every single year. And he, and he had, he had not that I'm saying I expected him to do that, but the fact that he comes in and is the exact opposite is it, you know kind of absorbs things first. That's what a real eventual leader does, and, and I think you're going to see as the spring goes along and we have an opportunity to talk to players and hopefully Julian at some point, we're going to hear more and more about how, you know, this guy came in kind of low key, but leading through example, those sorts of things. He said uh, in a lot of places, when you show up to work there for the first time, you, you want to spend some time keeping your mouth shut and your ears open is, is the way that James Franklin phrased that. And he, he said, James Franklin has really put his head down, gone to work, shot a commercial along the way, a pretty good one with the car dealership here in town. Uh, but it sounds like the work he's putting in the facility very much matches what the expectations were when he committed to Penn State. We wrote about it a bit about he was potentially going to give this group a boost beyond the box score. We'll see what the box score looks like for Julian Fleming because he has plenty to prove from a productivity standpoint. But from, he's like a professional asset, it feels like, uh, for this receiver group. I had a chance to check in with Carmelo Taylor earlier in the week the only freshman scholarship receiver on the roster last year, now redshirt freshman. I didn't get through my question about Julian Fleming and he was already like excited, smiling ear to ear and kind of ready to jump at the, the answer. He just says that thus far Fleming has been a great sounding board, a guy who's there to provide answers, advice when you need that. Um, and, and just kind of seeing the initial reaction, uh, genuine reaction from Carmelo Taylor on this you know fifth year senior coming from the, the top receiver room in the country just a lot of respect it addressed towards a new member of the roster. Um, Daniel, you wrote about Nolan Rucci, who was also asked about during James Franklin's press conference. And he's a guy that, like J Julian Fleming, was a five-star recruit from the state of Pennsylvania, was recruited by Penn State, went elsewhere in the Big Ten. Unlike Julian Fleming, he did not break through as a starter on that other campus. Uh, Wisconsin, fewer than 10 snaps during the regular season last year. He played a bunch in their bowl game. James Franklin told us that was really an important step for Rucci, getting some confidence, getting that extended run against LSU, but also for Penn State and their ability to kind of navigate his recruitment process. This is a guy who's four years removed from dominating high school trenches now. He's a redshirt junior. We know he's going to be working at right tackle. It's going to be a fun competition to follow between him and redshirt freshman Anthony Donko. What else did you gather from from what Fleming or from what Franklin had to say on Rucci? And now that we're, I guess, five, six weeks removed from from this being a really quick move from him going to the portal to Penn State, how are you wrapping your head around what he means for this 2024 team? I thought what James Franklin said about the the bowl game was really interesting um, because we, we hear it all the time, and I think that we do it sometimes in terms of how much stock can you actually put into a, into a bowl game? Um, you know, how much, you know, can you write those games off, et cetera. But when you look at uh, Nolan Rucci's career, I think he had seven, around 70 snaps in five games over his three seasons at Wisconsin. And I think about half of those snaps came in the bowl game. So I think that that is, that gave Penn state some real concrete data that gave Rucci some you know real tape, to take into the portal with him when he left. And so I think that I thought that that was interesting to hear you know, from Penn State, Penn State side that, yeah, they they looked at that tape. Um, James Franklin made the point that Wisconsin stayed really healthy on the offensive line and they didn't rotate guys, which kept uh, Rucci on the bench for, for most of his career. And then he talked about the physical side of things. Um, he said that Rucci came in at 299, 
uh, Penn State initially listed him on the roster at 300. Uh, now he's up to 305 um, on that six foot eight frame. Um, and and Franklin talks about that. That's that's a lot, you know. And to to keep weight on that type of frame takes a lot of work. Um, he kind of made it sound like that being you know under Phil Troutwine and and how Penn State develops its offensive linemen will help uh, Rucci. Uh, he said that that previous regime, uh, you know, under Paul Christ uh, out at Wisconsin, they wanted those guys to be massive. Um, and you saw it every year in the draft, the, the type of offensive lineman that Wisconsin was putting in um, that changed a little bit last year with Luke Fickle coming in. And now with coming to Penn State, you know, Rucci doesn't necessarily need to be, uh, you know, the biggest, baddest guy. You know, they can develop him. They can put him in the strength program um, to get him where he can be productive on the field for them. So I think that when we get look get these roster updates, I think that he is someone that is going to be really interesting to look at in terms of how his weight goes and you know, when we see him on the field, what that looks like um, and, and how he's able to use it. But I think that the you know what the way that Franklin phrased it is that there's a lot of excitement um, around Rucci, having him come in, come in, add him to the mix at tackle. Um, and I think that it's going to foster some competition and could make things you know, it, it gives you a different look kind of um, at the tackle spot. And guys like Chim Ono, Anthony Donko, who we heard from this week, very complimentary uh, uh, early on about what Nolan Rucci has brought to their group through some winter conditioning work uh, just by spending time together. Again, someone who spent three years at a pretty high level power five program there at Wisconsin, especially in that offensive line room with, with the tradition they have there. But you make a good point there, Daniel, uh, just about where things are, are going with this offensive front. Nolan Rucci's about the same i mean he's essentially the same weight as drew shelton with three inches taller than him and he's about 25 pounds lighter than anthony donko who just got to college campus last year so we'll see what what nolan rucci's maybe figure looks like uh, on that roster come august uh, but uh he, james franklin did qualify him as a skinny 305 when he was discussing him another player to get to and another former five star again penn state made some splashes in the transfer portal here uh aj harris Spent last year at Georgia, signed with them when they were the two-time defending uh, national champions, and he was the number two cornerback overall in 24-7 sports 2023 rankings. Uh, burned his red shirt last year, but did not play a lot, especially as the season went deeper in SEC play. Ended up being sixth on the Bulldogs roster among cornerbacks in game snaps. There was a, an opportunity there for and some excitement in Athens, as we heard from Jordan Hill, who covers Georgia for 24-7 sports. There was excitement about what he could be for them in year two, and they were invested in him, uh, but he opted to take a different approach, went into the portal and pretty quickly connected with Penn State. Penn State had offered him midway through his sophomore year of high school. Again, high-level talent here. Um, and he ultimately gets to Penn State and rolls. Not much a fanfare, not much of a big, uh, splashy announcement around it. He's just all of a sudden here on campus. And this is a guy who, when you kind of look at where the cornerback room is going, and there's three vacancies there without Daquan Hardy and without uh, Kalen King, without Johnny Dixon, it's easy to say, well, Cam Miller, he's got to be considered into that mix because he is an experienced player. Jalen Kimber was a starter last year in the SEC for the Florida Gators. But let's face it, Florida Gators and the Georgia Bulldogs had very different rosters and very different defensive success. And in my opinion, Mark, A.J. Harris is a guy that I think a lot of fans are kind of just overlooking. I think there's been a lot of focus on Nolan Rucci, a lot of focus on Julian Fleming. I understand that because of the, the familiarity there and, and their five-star backgrounds. But Harris, because of this position, because of where he is coming from in the college football world, and also because of the way Franklin described him as someone who he had completely won over by the second conversation. He, he said this kid had done his homework, was, was the quote that James Franklin used. He said he knew the roster. He knew how the defense worked. He knew a lot of the defensive metrics. He knew the coaching staff. And he was really prepared for their conversation. Mark, this guy, to me, could be a home run in year one if he can put it together. I love who he was as a playmaker in high school. It's a little hard to figure out where he is based on one year with the, probably the most talented roster in college football in 2023, but he comes in at the right time for Penn State, and I just think this is one that generally the population of Penn State supporters might be sleeping on a little bit. Yeah, I have that quote up too, and, and the other thing Frankel said, so right away this guy was talking about things in my mind that really matter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that I mean, that's a big talk, quote. You're talking about – a level of maturity from a young guy. You know what I mean? I mean, l listen, we, we have the opportunity to talk to a lot of kids and most of them carry themselves really well. 
but to be 18 years old or, or whatever he is and to look at it this analytically um you know i just think that speaks to a level of maturity that that i think is going to bode him bode well for him i mean we could talk about athleticism we could talk about upside we could talk about what georgia saw because we know if georgia's recruiting a kid you know they're they're not recruiting scrubs um uh, but i just think those quotes from franklin speak to a level of maturity that are going to allow him to be successful, you know, within this program, whether it's this year, whenever it may be. But I think, you know, just, just, uh, you know, I, I don't know a ton about the kid, but from everything you hear, it sounds like he's the kind of guy who could come in and make an immediate impact. All right. Well, on Tuesday, aside from getting James Franklin, as I said, we got a chance to speak with uh, more than 20, more than two dozen second year members of this Penn State roster. It was scholarship players. It was walk-ons alike. It was very enlightening. And it's not something we're going to be able to cover here on, on one segment of our podcast, but we're going to go through. We each selected a few guys we wanted to spotlight. We have a lot more coverage to, to come at lines247.com. We got a dedicated thread right now on our message board, kind of dropping notes on this stuff as we go through it. We have a lot of audio to listen to. Again, 20 plus guys. Give us a little bit of time, but we're going to go through some of the highlights right now. We'll start with you, Mark, because you had a chance to sit there with the number one ranked member of this class when they all got to campus last January, Javen Williams, in-state offensive lineman, a guy who got a little bit of run at the offensive tackle spot last year, but preserved redshirt status like all those offensive linemen did. What stood out to you in your time with Williams? Hey, first of all, this this group, I thought, was just terrific. You know, that can't be an easy thing. The, the way Penn State does it, and I have no problem with it, because eventually we're going to have an opportunity to talk to these kids. But for people who don't realize, Penn State does not make true freshmen available to the media. So typically, our first access, if it's at a New Year's Six Bowl, some of them do have media days on site, some of them don't. The Peach Bowl did not. At those things, typically like at the Rose Bowl, the true freshman, the entire roster is available. This was the first availability for all of these kids. And to walk into that situation, it's in the recruiting lounge at, at the at the stadium. And I just want to set the, the, the scene, Tyler. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a horde of media there. And these kids are sitting at tables with microphones and cameras and um hidden iPhones sitting right in front of them. And, you know, it's not, it can't be an easy thing. And I think overall, these guys just handled themselves extremely well. And I will tell you that for, for my money, Javen Williams, you know, I told one of the SIDs, I said, you got to get this guy in front of the media because he carries himself extremely, extremely well. Again, I, I want to say that, that all these guys did, but for, you know, I, I was just kind of blown away. And then I learned from him, and I think this is just so important. You know, we had heard last preseason that this was one of the offensive linemen they had they thought had a chance to play early. You know, maybe not quite where Shelton was the year before, but they saw an upside in this kid. And they did something that, to me, was so smart. Even though he wasn't playing in the road games early in the year, they traveled him, and he roomed with Olu Fashionu. I mean, just brilliant. And to hear him explain what that meant to him, how Olu conducted himself like a professional, how the night before games, Olu in the hotel room wasn't playing video games, you know, wasn't eating. He was stretching. He was working. <laughs> he was working at becoming better in the hotel room. And this rubbed off on this kid. I mean, that really, really stood out to me. He told me, or us, some of us sitting there, he, when, when he arrived, and, and I always love talking about this because you see what a difference a college weight program and strength program makes. He arrived at 287, and he played last year at 317. I mean, that, you know, he's got a huge frame, but but still – he said he's down to 310 now, and, and he wants to be in that 310 to 315 range. That's kind of his sweet spot. Uh, so Mark, I just – Mark, he, they've got him at 304 on the latest roster update. Yeah, so well, he, this was – you know, yeah, he, he yeah. got some work, though. I mean, that's that's pretty – I mean, he's, he's putting some work on his body is what I'm also, getting. Also, he's, he's only 18, so I'm just jumping around my notes here. He doesn't turn 19. He, he said he's the youngest member of the class, and it's like – 
so you can see where the coaching staff, you, 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 the, and I'm not saying he's the next Olu. I'm not putting that on anybody. But I just thought it was brilliant that the coaching staff, because he was talking, I'm like, how did you end up, you know, rooming with Olu? And he's like, well, I'm really not sure. And I was like, you know, they don't do any of this stuff just by chance. I mean, <laughs> they obviously saw something in you. And then it gets even better. This kid, his dad, when he played football, and his brother, when they played football, both at lower levels, high school or, or smaller college, ward number 74. He's got 74 tattooed on his arm, and he let it slip. Uh, I, I want to see exactly how he said it. Yeah, he, uh, so he kind of let it slip. He was 70 last year, and then he, he he let it slip and it said something along the lines of, so I'm wearing it. And I said, so you got 74. He's like, well, no, there's like a 50-50 chance that I'll get it. But so the fact that one of the incoming freshmen has 70 at this point, I think we could expect to see him in 74. But listen, we could talk about X's and O's and, and what these guys do and leverage and all this stuff. But one of the very cool things about, about this availability to me is getting to know these kids and, and what they're about and how they carry themselves. So those are some of the little tidbits from, from him that I thought just were really good. You're 1,000% accurate about this being an opportunity. To, we've had a lot of these guys on the podcast. Fortunately, we, we, we get a kind of a leg up on, on, on some of our competition getting to know these guys. But in terms of, of kind of really going face-to-face -face and getting to know them, the post game at the Peach Bowl wasn't the best time. I, I spoke to Anthony Donka and, and Tony Rojas oh, right. in the locker room in Atlanta. But there's only so much these guys want to talk about themselves and their progression and their development. There's only so much I want to ask about it after a performance like that and a team yeah. loss. And so this was a much better opportunity to, to speak with these guys. And, and you mentioned that Williams currently on the roster, technically sharing the number 70 uniform with new freshman Garrett Sexton. Um, just piggybacking off of that a little more briefly with, with the offensive tackle spot. Chimdi Ono is a guy who is another fascinating figure to follow there because he has put on about 50 pounds since he got to campus. And if I, if I remember correctly, he was the last guy or one of the last guys to get here to campus last June, if I, if I remember that accurately. And he was around 275 pounds. And I remember thinking at that time, well, he looks bigger than I thought because we had his head coach from the high school level on this podcast before he got here to campus. And he was like, you know, he's, he's a project. There's, there's no way around it. He's raw. He was an old dominion commit. People started sniffing around him, started seeing his senior season highlights. And then all of a sudden he's a power five commodity down the stretch uh, uh, last winter and Penn state wins out and really potentially adds a tremendous punctuation mark to that 2023 class, because not only is Ono uh, pr you know, more further along advanced physically than I think we could have anticipated for a non early enrollee going from 275 to 323, I think he is now. Uh, but also, I think he was really well put together in, in our practice looks and, and, and in some of the game looks. I thought he was a little more technically sound than I thought he might be based on what we had heard about his high school trajectory and kind of where he was as an athlete versus a football player. And I just think there's a lot to like about Ono right now um, and, and a lot to like about that depth, that tackle, because you bring in Rucci, which gives you a, a veteran presence and a fortification. Uh, but you've got Anthony Donko, who we've discussed a bunch on this podcast, and and he's certainly going to be in the mix to start. But Javen Williams and Shimdi Ono, I think, are in a really good spot to 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 go and, and nibble at the heels and maybe do more than that with Drew Shelton. Um, Elliot, these are all former top 24-7 prospects. Javen Williams out of those three it is the highest pedigree as a recruit, as a five-star prospect. But when you look at that group, it's going to be fun to follow because uh, unlike years past where, where it feels like can you find one offensive tackle to, to really you know take control of this thing, I think we're looking at two, three guys on each side that we want to get longer looks at over the course of spring ball. Viewing Drew Shelton as the prohibitive favorite there at this stage at, at the left side because of his experience. But I'm really curious. And Ono told us that he can cross train. He expects to maybe cross train some more. He, he did that last year, but he said his comfort level is on the left side. And we certainly saw a lot more of Javen Williams on the left side last year. Another name to get to on the offensive line, we're going to get Daniel Gallon do the honors on this one. He was a highly rated one too, top 100 recruit out of high school, a two-time state wrestling champion, 
uh, one of the leading members of Penn State's 2023 class, but ultimately did not get on the field for any of the 13 games last fall, although he was available on the practice field, Alex Birchmeyer. He's somebody who got the kind of opposite of Anthony Donka, started off last year at tackle, ended up working his way to an interior role by the end of it. That's where he spent his time uh, at guard during the fall after being a tackle in, for much of the spring. Daniel, this was kind of those mystery conversations that we wanted to have. And this is one of the guys we had. You're the one who was there with the Birchmeyer. What did you learn? Yeah, I, I thought it was really interesting to talk to him, uh, given his trajectory in terms of being a very you know, highly regarded recruit um, and then coming in and you know, we didn't really see him. You know, he was kind of out of sight. Um, you know, He was on the mind of, of some of our subscribers who wanted to know more about him as the season went on. But, you know, Mostly it was in scout team looks, uh, the, the little bit that we got. Um, but he said that you know, he liked that experience out at right guard, um, that, you know, dealing, kind of getting that, you know, really quick introduction uh, to college football in terms of, you know, going against some of these defensive ends off the edge, he said was, was pretty informative for him. And he stuck at right guard and, and really likes that um, for him. Um, yeah, I think the one thing in, in talking to him is that, I think that he kind of recognizes the the role that having that red shirt year will play in his development. Um, he said that the mental side of the game was a little bit more difficult to adjust to than the physical side of the game. Um, you know, he's a really big kid. We know that he's a good athlete um, because of the, the type of wrestler that he was um, down in Northern Virginia. But I, I thought that that was kind of a, you know, it was, pretty candid uh, in terms of assessing where he was last year, what he needed to improve on and, and where he is now. So uh, the interior of the Penn state offensive line, I mean, they've got a ton of bodies there right now. Uh, a lot, a couple guys with pretty extensive starting experience. So, you know, if Alex Birchmeyer, you know, makes a move, it would have to be a really big one, but I think that he is someone too, where um, he kind of has that, that long view on things that, he knows that these things take time. He knows that there's an adjustment. Um, you know, he know that he knows that this is kind of how it's going to work for him. You know, it doesn't work for everyone the the same way. You know, not everyone is Drew Shelton playing right away. Not everyone is Anthony Donka having you know kind of how his season ended last year. So I think Birch Meyer is someone who you know it'll be interesting to see if he can crack that too deep or what that kind of looks like. Um, but uh, you know, he seemed pretty. You know, he, he seemed like he understood, you know, how his freshman year went and what it means for his future. Sal Wormley back, projected third-year starter at right guard, but it's year six for him. So jockeying for position on that offensive interior right now are a few guys, the uh, Vega Ioane, Nick Dawkins, uh, J.B. Nelson, and then a younger player like Alex Birchmeyer. He's still got Golden Israel, Shumba on this roster, a year five guy who's not made it a game impact yet, but our Birchmeyer within striking distance of having that two deep role. This figures to be a big spring for him. Uh, maybe the most buzzy name this time last year, and, and as we went through that first semester with the freshman freshman class was Tony Rojas and ultimately didn't necessarily come to fruition on the football field in a massive way because Penn State stayed healthy at linebacker and they had the goods at linebacker on the top of that depth chart but when we did get Tony Rojas out there the sample size was damn impressive he had two takeaways uh two turnovers forced against Maryland and, and like 11 snaps um and he was very productive although he was banged up for a little bit in that peach bowl when he was out there you could see him flying around uh, I mean, we've heard so many good things about Tony Rojas. I'm excited to see what it looks like when he gets more than 120 snaps on the course of the season. I think he's pretty well lined up to do that. Mark, you were there with Mr. Rojas, and, and he's a guy who's – he's got that potential to become one of the faces of this defense as his career moves forward. Yeah, we had heard tales about his weight gain, and I wanted to get it directly from him because sometimes when you hear from other players or if you hear from coaches, either the numbers aren't quite right or – they may exaggerate just a little bit. So for the record, from Tony Rojas, when he arrived at Penn State in uh, January of 2023, he weighed 190 pounds. <laughs> By last season, he was 220. And now, despite what the roster has him at, at 225, he is 232. Ah. This guy has put on 42 pounds in a year. And he said his focus now, he's where he wants to be size-wise, is becoming even faster. 
So he went about putting on that weight and he said there were times when he didn't feel quite as fast and then he would kind of work on, you know, getting his speed back to where it was as, you know, a tremendous high school running back as well. But, you know, I just think that goes to show you the the, the physical transformations. I talked about Javen. When you see it on a massive athlete like that, you know, it's not that eye popping, but when you see it on this sort of kid, it's like, okay, you know, this guy was serious about getting bigger. And, you know, I think we know enough about Chuck Losey and the way he does things that he's just not going to let these guys balloon up. And if you if you look at Rojas now, you know, walking around in street clothes, you can see that this is, you know, he, there's not there, there is not any bad weight on Tony Rojas at 232 pounds. I asked him, you know, last year he played that will position. And I said, how much positional – flexibility do you have and he said in in the tom allen system you're looking at those mike and wills being very similar uh to to, to one another I, it sounded like even more similar than they were previously but he said he's open to playing the sam as well so he didn't rule that out and i think some other players were indicating that that may be where he ends up maybe he was just trying to keep things on the lowdown uh, but I think he's the sort of athlete could, who could help them in different spots. But I thought people would be interested in hearing straight from uh, Tony Rojas uh, what his physical transformation was all about. Dom DeLuca was uh, clearly the number two guy at the sand position last year behind Curtis Jacobs, and he handled a lot of that work in the Peach Bowl as well. But Tony Rojas, I agree. I mean, I, I, when he got to campus last year, I didn't know if he was the kind of guy who could could really legitimately go out and play all these various positions. But he could. I mean, we saw Curtis Jacobs do it during his career, and I think Tony Rojas is the, the kind of athlete, and it sounds like he has the kind of awareness out there as a defender to really get it done. Um, really excited to see what Tom Allen can do with him. And, and sticking at linebacker, someone who did not cross that red shirt threshold last year, but really garnered a lot of praise from this staff and teammates as things went on is Kavion Keys. He's someone that we heard about more and more behind the scenes as the fall went on. And by the end of that process, he was named the scout team player of the year, not just on defense, but on special teams. I think he shared those with a couple other guys, but he was singled out in those two phases by this coaching staff for what he did. And he's a guy that just talking to those around the program and Kavion himself, if things had gotten to the point last year where you need another linebacker to contribute. You know, someone goes down at the top of that depth chart or there's a performance issue. There was a lot of confidence in what Kavion Keys could have accomplished last year. Uh, I think very much like Andrew Rapley, a tight end, um, could have accomplished last year if he was needed. But you want to talk about physical development. He played 195 uh, during his high school senior season when, when he was a North Carolina commit and Penn State was chasing him, all that different stuff. He was a highly touted prospect in North Carolina. Now he's over 220 pounds. I think he's right around 223 pounds. Um, and, and it says he's gotten faster. I'm sorry, 226 on the updated roster. I know he said he's working his way toward 230. But keys to me with uh, with the move uh, from Abdul Carter from linebacker to defensive end is probably the name that, that went up. That I raised on the flagpole more than any other when I saw this development on the roster because – Keys has spent a lot of time shadowing uh, Abdul Carter in that will role, um, and he sounded like he was eager and ready and willing to step up. And he didn't blow the, the blow the news on Abdul Carter. It would have been pretty interesting if he was like, "No, Abdul's not playing that anymore." But um, he is a guy that I think probably has much confidence in anyone who redshirted last year uh, on this entire class, uh, in my opinion, and just based on what we've heard around the program. And it's tough to, to kind of hang your hat on a lot with a guy who hasn't you know been involved for more than 50 or so snaps and hasn't been out there for more than three or four games. But I think out of everybody who didn't go out there and, and, and play a little more extensively last year, he's the one that I think could jump up to a really formidable role within this defense. I think he's going to be a, a, a stalwart on special teams as well. But KV on keys, man. He is a name on the rise. And, and another guy who didn't come close to red shirt uh, burning last year is Cam Wallace. Not only did he not get the four games, he didn't get to one game. And Daniel and I have discussed this quite a bit because we each kind of called our shot over the course of last offseason, even early in September and saying, keep an eye on Cam Wallace. He could be an X factor in that running back room. It didn't materialize in this way. But this is a really interesting kind of catch up with a guy that Heard a lot of good things about. He's come a long way physically since he got to campus, but we don't know what it looks like against Power 5 competition in a game setting yet. Yeah, we're going to stick with the, the physical transformation theme here because on the latest roster update, he's at 199 pounds. Mm -hmm. uh, and when Cam Wallace got here, I think he was 175 and 
the kind of the the talk about him. Uh, you know, you had him in London Montgomery coming in, and you know, last summer it was like, well, London Montgomery has a lot of rehab to do, and then Cam Wallace has a lot of physical development to do. He might not be ready. Um, and then you get to August, and both of them are, you know. Montgomery is participating in practice. Uh, Cam Wallace is, I think he was up to 191 pretty early last year. And, and Jalen Sider was just kind of like, yeah, we've got them and we're working them and, and we're developing them, um, which I think sets the table for an interesting competition for the number three spot this year. But uh, Cam Wallace was someone who I think that him and Elliot Washington, the cornerback struck me as two of the more kind of serious and intense guys in terms of how they considered your questions, you know, kind of how they chose their words, how they kind of talked about, um, you know, what they've done at Penn State so far. Uh, Cam Wallace was really complimentary uh, towards Nick Singleton uh, and Katron Allen as, you know, players who have helped bring him along um, and have been mentors and have been very helpful. And uh, he's really, I think the one thing that struck me is he's really looking forward to the competition um, that Penn State is going to have in the running back room this year. You know, they lost Trey Potts. We know kind of how important that number three running back can be at a position that can really put you through the, the physical grind. Um, and, and between London Montgomery, who was the, the only member of the class we didn't get to talk to uh, on Tuesday because of a, a scheduling conflict, um, Cam Wallace, then you bring in Quentin Martin for, for spring ball, and Corey Smith will be there eventually. Um, you know, there's going to be a lot of competition in that room. And I think Cam Wallace said that he's really looking forward to, to that experience. Um, you know, I also asked Wallace about, you know, later in his recruit, later in his high school career, he was kind of had that athlete label. Uh, he was playing both ways. Um, I believe he could have been a power five prospect on the defensive side of the ball uh, in the secondary. Um, and he said that having that really well-rounded experience uh, he feels really helps him uh, as on the offensive side of the ball that he kind of knows what defensive backs are thinking. Um, you know, that's experience that he's still applying as he's going through things offensively. So I think that he said that even with this weight, he still has that home run hitting ability that I think we, that I thought we might get the chance to see last year. Um, obviously we haven't seen it yet, but I think that he's someone too, that when they get the pads on, when they're out there in Beaver stadium uh, in April, that, He's someone that maybe we can finally see some of those fireworks. Jay Wan Sider told us last summer that uh, Cam Wallace is the kind of guy who can strike up the band from anywhere on the football field. And those are the kind of players that you want to get involved, even if it's for a couple touches here and there. But if he's looking ahead at Nick Singleton and Catron Allen, all of a sudden he's looking back to the new kid in town, Quentin Martin, who was identified today on Thursday as the top performer in winter conditioning session number four uh, by Jay Wan Sider. Quentin Martin, of course, a 24-7 prospect as the competition uh, does not dwindle in that running back room. Um, Mark, over at, at the defensive secondary, one of the more versatile figures, I think, for this year and beyond for Penn State is going to be King Mack. He has never possessed the wow measurements in terms of height and length but he was one of the most productive defensive backs, also a special teams menace uh, for St. Thomas Aquinas, four state championship runs at one of the premier programs in the country. He commits to Penn State. He sticks with Penn State. He signs with Penn State. And last year he burned red shirt. We didn't see much of him in defensive action, especially once we got into the thick of conference play. Very rarely was he out there. Uh, we did get him out there for, for, for a bunch of special teams work, but King Mack from the safety spot where he could be a, certainly a contender for a too deep role there. But to me, replacing Daquan Hardy is paramount. And what he was able to do in the slot and in everything I've heard from King Mack and about King Mack suggests he could be a solution there. What else do we need to know about the year two player from South Florida? Yeah, let me circle back to Cam Wallace really quick because yeah. when I was with him, uh, he mentioned that he had some sort of setback last year, and then he mentioned that he had never been injured before in his life. Um, he was so, sidelined a bit, and I think coming out of preseason camp. Right. So I said, you know, I asked, were you bumped up? Can you? Can, and he just stared at me and, and didn't want to say anything. <laughs> which is, and, and I want to be clear, I'm not making fun of the kid, but it's drilled into these kids yeah. not to talk about injuries and for him to be confronted with that. But I could not ask because he had mentioned that he had a setback and that, that he had, that, that he had never been injured before but he said I think he put it I, I want to turn a setback into a step up so just I wanted to add that to, to to the context of him not playing last year because I don't know how much he would have played anyway or you know whether that factored into it or not but 
with respect to King Mac, yeah, I mean, he's viewing himself as being, you know, a nickel slot type guy he, that he can that he can step in and, and play that position as well. And we've seen in the past that Penn State has used guys from different positions to handle those roles. He also thinks that he could be the guy who who steps up as a punt returner. I know there are some other people who may have some things to say about that, but uh, you know, clearly when you look at the speed that he has. Um, you're, you're talking about a, a multiple time state track champion down in Florida, which there's something to be said for that. Not that you sneeze at being a track champion in Pennsylvania, but I said, so what did you run last year? Again, trying to get it, you know, straight from, 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 from the player. And he said he ran four, three. And I think we all know that Daquan Hardy's high up on that list at four, two something. And he said, his goal is to get down into the four twos, but one of the, the the again, I love these opportunities because you can ask about some different things. And when you think about King Mac, what's how, how do you get that name? How did you get the name King Mac? And you know, sometimes you ask a question like that, and you don't. It, 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 yeah, they, I don't know. My my parents came up with it. My, it was my you know great uncle's name or something. This. He said that his dad named me. Uh, he said that his dad said that Mac stands for number one, and that he was when he was born. He said, "You're going to be the king of the Max. You're going to be the king of the number ones." And then he said, "His dad said your name is what you have to represent." Whoa! I mean, I was like, again, this is like an 18, 19 year old kid. <laughs> explaining his name in a way where it's like, wow. I mean, I, I was truly like, you know, that, that to me w was really impressive. And then you think, how the heck did his dad know? I mean, <laughs> his, his dad obviously knew something was going on because this kid is really good. So again, just another one of those different stories that we're able to get when we finally talk to these kids one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, last time we saw a safety filling that role in slot coverage was Lamont Wade back in 2020, I believe. Uh, mixed results there. Daquan Hardy was so consistent in recent years that it really feels like a, a, just a pivotal piece of this equation as Penn State you know, uh, has new faces and new places and stuff like that. Who is going to surface there? And King Mack has been mentioned as a potential candidate for that job since his earliest days on campus last year. Um, just to, to follow up on that in the secondary with some of these second-year players, Zion Tracy is another guy who, who was banged up last year. I, I brought up that subject. He didn't want to get into it. But this time last year, we saw him in an arm sling uh, during a thon event here at Penn State. And he wasn't involved for spring practices, which the fact that at the end of the fall, he leads all freshmen in snaps, that's a bit surprising. I mean, because he's not the, the most physically imposing figure in this class. He wasn't out. They didn't really get the benefit from the head start of being an early enrollee on the football field. And yet, when you look at the end of it, He's right around 150 snaps, which isn't a ton, but it did lead this freshman class. And Tracy said he took pride in that. I don't know if he was aware of it before I brought it up, but that he was the the most active freshman out there. And he's someone that I can tell you, they, they, a different approach. Elliot Washington, much more of a, a thorough conversationalist, I would say, whereas Zion Tracy, maybe more about his business in, in the conversation. Um, just he'll get you the answer. It may not be what you're looking for, but he'll, he'll tell you what he's thinking. With, with, with Zion Tracy. I sensed almost a little bit of a, a chip on his shoulder uh, when, when the Peach Bowl conversation arose and then some of that kind of stuff about the ability to go prove themselves and about bringing in these transfer players. And it just sounds like with the Washington, with Tracy, these guys have that starting position on their mind. And the fact that you bring in a former Florida Gator starter in Kimber and a guy who's one year removed from his five-star status at Georgia uh, in A.J. Harris and that Cam Miller's still in town and, and all the other moving pieces – I think Elliot Washington and the physicality he showed on the practice field in year one was something we more expected. But the physicality from Zion Tracy matching up with the speed that he brings was really a, a different dynamic for him in that cornerback room. And he's become maybe a, a kind of a different painted picture uh, in terms of these prospects, what we thought we had figured out in the class last January versus who we kind of are, are, are learning about now. He's come a long way, in my opinion, uh, being kind of just another guy in that cornerback room and a guy who I thought was going to have to to really spend some time catching up to others. He's now right in that mix to, to play a bunch of football. And, you know, he talked about not necessarily knowing what his role was going to be in the Peach Bowl, but expecting to play a big role. Big role. And, and he was out there as much as anybody except Daquan Hardy at the cornerback position. Cam Miller out there extensively, of, of course, as well. Uh, but I, I think he came out of that and he said, 
uh, he, he felt pretty good about it. And, and I know in, in live time, people are kind of saying, what's going on at the cornerback position? We're losing these guys. Um, but I think Zion Tracy kind of feels boosted by what he was able to accomplish in that bowl game, what he was exposed to from a very good receiving core against Ole Miss. And I think what he anticipates on the spring, uh, spring practice field for Penn State this year, both him and Elliott Washington, keep them at the forefront when we talk about this cornerback spot, I think they both have the ability to go start for the team. They both very much have the drive. And I think thus far they've proven it physically uh, that they have that ability to, to, to go become linchpin kind of players for Penn State, if not in 2024, then 2025 or, or beyond that. Um, another name to get to here that's going to play a prominent role in this defense and, and maybe not as big now that we factor in Abdul Carter on the edge, but Jameel Lyons. You know, we've discussed the excitement building around him since last fall and, and when he got to campus and made some moves in August camp. And Mark, by the time we get through the Peach Bowl, he's somebody that a lot of people are pointing to and saying he is, you know, that next edge rusher to, to keep an eye on, you know, deny Dennis Sutton's up next right now, but then Jamil Lyons is waiting in the wings and he could really be on an accelerated track. What stood out from your time with Jamil? I know he's got a pretty big personality. Yeah, he definitely does. You know, uh, he uh, he said he got in here at like 235, and he's up to about 252, 255 now. Uh, said his upper limit is probably 260 at 65. So uh, just on, on those particulars, because we've been hitting him with some of these players where where size makes a difference. It's not it's maybe not that big of a deal with some of the DBs and smaller players. But he told a story that I just thought was was tremendous about preseason camp. So before they would get into um, the, prime, the the main parts of, of a practice, uh, they would warm up and then they would do one-on-one -on -one drills between the offensive linemen and defensive linemen. And we've been there where they've done the Lions Pride or whatever they call it, uh, where it's skill players versus defensive backs. But the the we've been there with the, the offensive and defensive linemen at different times too. And the way that happens is, Franklin calls out different players. So nobody knows who's going to go. So he just goes and has a list of who he's going to call out. Well, early in camp, he says, Jameel Lyons. And Lyons is like, okay, you know, I'm ready to go. Olu. <laughs> and he's like, it was, Lyons said to me, okay, I'm about to go. Like he was like, he was laughing as I asked him, you know, his first encounter with Olu, what it was like. And he said, so he gets in there and I tried to power him and he stood me right up and I'm like, oh man, this is in front of the whole team. So he was laughing as he said that, but imagine when you're Jameel Lyons and you go through that early in camp and now you get into the season and chop robinson's hurt and they're asking you to go in and, and see some extra snaps against whatever opponent it was well you got your ass kicked by olu on the third <laughs> day of camp how much worse could any of this possibly be and i put po i posted the video of that and folks I, I would tell you to look at it because again i i know i keep going back to this but learning the personalities of these kids and the smile on this guy's face when he's talking about this moment in his career that could have been embarrassing, but he didn't take it that way. He took it as a learning experience. So I just, it, it, you know, he obviously said that with, with different players uh, heading to the NFL, uh, Chop and Adisa, that he views it as this is his time to really step up and get things done. But that little background story about, about going up against Olu and the way he just smiled and laughed – at himself almost while telling it was pretty cool. And then, you know, I also said, well, what does it kind of mean to you? What's it going to mean to you when you see this guy go, you know, number five overall or, or, or what, or whatever it's going to be. And uh, he said, they are not wrong when he's talking about NFL scouts. He's the real deal because he learned from experience. So it was, it was nice talking to Jamil. It should probably come as no surprise that Olu Fashinu dished out some life lessons to young defenders uh, last year, and 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 Jamil was not alone, as Daniel Gallon learned. <laughs> yeah, I was I was chatting with with Mason Robinson and you know talking to him about what it was like to go up against Olu and and also Caden Wallace, and it it does sound like that. I think that we regarded Olu and Caden as probably two of the 
you know, we, we knew what Olu's leadership was and, and we kind of know how those two guys are wired. And it does sound like that they really did help these young defensive ends along uh, over the course of the season. And so, you know, I was talking to Mason Robinson about going up against Olu and he had kind of a similar realization that Jimmy Alliance did that you know, the first time he did it, he just got completely stonewalled, had had nothing going on. But he said that, you know, over the course of the year that you know, he would figure out different things, you know, different leverages, you know, different approaches that he felt his own game really coming along as he was going up against Olu kind of week after week. And, you know, he kind of you know gained a lot of confidence and really started to put things together. And, you know, he was like, yeah, like, I, you know, I feel really good about the development that I got over the course of Olu. I, over the course of the season against Olu, I, I felt like I really, really, you know, developed and so I was like, oh, so I was like, so what was it like when like the way that Mason's talking about it? It's like, oh, you know, it sounds like he got him at some point that it really like clicked for him and he was able to put it all together. So I asked him, I was like, oh, so Mason, like, what was it like when you finally got Olu? And he's like, oh, yeah, no, I never got him. <laughs> he was like, <laughs> <laughs> he was like, I, I, I never took it, took it all the way there. But, you know, everything else, you know, I felt like that I was, you know, I learned different ways and, and different things I could do to to get closer <laughs> each time. And so, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of times there's expectations on these freshmen when you see like the rank of a class and the rank of a prospect and the attention that a guy gets that there's, you know, a lot of kind of, you know, why isn't this happening now uh, with some of these prospects? And you think about what it's like for an 18 year old to be going up against, you know, Olu was young, but you know, a fourth year player, kind of the real learning curve there is and, and the real kind of difficulty that there can be. I, I think that, you know, talking to some of these guys that redshirted last year and were on scout team and really had to take their lumps. I, I think that that kind of shows the the complete experience and, you know, the amount of learning and amount of work that really does you know go into this development. Now picture a 212 pound uh, freshman tight end version of Joey Schlafer last spring <laughs> trying to deal with uh, Adiza Isaac, Denai Dennis Sutton, and Shop Robinson on a regular basis. That was, you know, a, a, a period of hell for a lot of these newcomers, especially the tight end position at, on those edge spots on the perimeter, because it's, it's just a major mismatch physically when you first get to campus. And for those who are like, who's Mason Robinson? But, you know, he was one of those guys who came last year at defensive end along with Joseph Mapoye and did not factor into plans beyond the practice field. But two more names there to know, along with Lions in that defensive end group um, moving ahead. But I just want to pick it up on, on Schlafer as we wrap things up here, um, because him and Andrew Rapelier were the two man class. And I have spent a ton of time talking about Andrew Rapelier on this podcast and I'll continue to do so. And I tell you what, he is hungry uh, just sitting down with him for a bit. He feels like this class has a lot to unveil uh, this year. He called the 2023 Penn State roster loaded and described that, hey, we all came to Penn State for a reason. We knew that it might not mean uh, as much impactful work as a fresh as a freshman than you might find in other campuses. But if you stay the course and go through it, a, a entire career at Penn State, you're going to come out the other side getting what you want. And so Andrew Rapier has really bought into that. I think that was a pretty impressive deal. You know, he's a guy who came here ready to play last year. And, and he saw what Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren did. And he saw what Khalil Dinkins was able to step up and do in that third role. And so a lot of respect to, uh, for that room. They, they call them aces for a reason. It's a really talented bunch. He said as much as it would have maybe opened the door for him to see Tyler Warren take off and follow Theo to the NFL. He was really grateful that the that, that Tyler Warren's going to be a part of this group again. Not only did he say, well, he's that dude uh, at a tight end. You know, he's a guy who's going to be a leader for us and get it done produ production-wise. But Rappelier says now at any point in any game, at any practice, there is someone in that tight end group that they can turn to who's been through the situation. There's not a situation that he hasn't faced right now in a Penn State uniform. And as much as you love Khalil Dinkins, what he might bring to you, He's still certainly more green in terms of that experience in big time plays. Uh, but Joey Schlaffer, Schlaffer is a guy that we got to maybe just pay a little bit more attention to. He was 212 pounds, as I mentioned, last spring. He's now at 235, and he told me he's, his target is to get to 245 pounds uh, over the course of the semester. So we're talking about real Big Ten tight end weight, and that was the question with Joey Schlaffer. We're going to see if Luke Reynolds can work his way up the, the, the pounds as well in the next couple of years. But with Schleifer, he has been picked as the top competitor of that room at three of the four winter workout sessions by position coach Ty Howell. Sounds like he's really putting in a lot of work. I think Andrew Rappelier said the only thing working against him is 
to this point, Mother Nature. And but Schleifer said he's, he's pouring those calories. He credited uh, a one particular 1500 calorie milkshake from Cold Stone Creamery. He also said he goes hard on Chipotle. It sounds like Chipotle is really helped put on a lot of the mass for this freshman class because I heard them referenced by like three dudes. But uh, it, I just really I, I came away from that conversation putting a little bit more spotlight on Schleifer than I thought at the tight end position, because you can work your way through it. You can forget to mention Jerry Cross, who in his own right is a former five-star prospect. You throw in Luke Reynolds, who's the number one tight end in the country. And we already mentioned the other guys on campus, but Schleifer could be a guy who's moving, moving up the, in the world, in the Penn state world, at least uh, with a little bit more rapid pace than we anticipated. I'll be really curious to see how he comes out of the spring. Really exceptional receiver at the high school level. We wondered what it might look like as he transitioned to a full-on Big Ten tight end. We're starting to see that come to fruition now. Guys, did we miss anything? We've gone over an hour and 20 minutes. I know we missed a lot, and that's why we have a website that people can find at lines247.com. We have a ton coming your way from these conversations, things we've discussed here in greater detail at the site, things we didn't even get to here on the podcast that we're going to spend a lot of time discussing with our VIP subscribers. But just quickly open the door for either of you. Been a busy week. I may have missed something. We may have missed something. Mark, Daniel, anything to add? Just a couple things. Schlafer. Uh, probably could get some advice on adding weight from his big brother, Michael Mennett. Doesn't want to get that big, but, <laughs> but, but maybe add a few pounds. And, you know, I also wanted to say that we're very fortunate that we have the time and the resources to cover as many camps as we do. And, you know, not not everybody has can, can have that singular focus the way we do. And by being able to do that, we get to see so many of these kids actually playing. And Tyler, you get a lot of them on the podcast. So so you get to know them. And when you get to know them, we get to know them. And Brian Doan and the recruiting team, they talk to these kids. So we get to know them through them. And now Tyler Calvaruso. So I'm not bragging, but I'm saying we go into these things with a little bit of a leg up on a lot of people just because we've been following these guys forever. And then, you know, we, we don't talk to them for a year. And then it's really fun to go in after that year and see how they've grown and matured and kind of developed. And again, I would just like to close by saying, I thought these guys handled themselves really well. It Not that we've ever been to one of these things and, and guys have handled themselves poorly, but I think it speaks to kind of the, the, the type of kid that Penn State recruits. And I'm not just saying that. I mean, it is not easy to go in there and answer questions the way that these guys do with all of us sticking our microphones and cameras in their face. thought they did a really nice job and was really happy to, that we were able to have that availability. I agree with you. And we're in for the full ride with these guys. When they commit when they're 16 to when they leave when they're 23, 24, we're, we're, we're covering every step of the way. I think a good uh, you know, example is we had Caden Wallace on the podcast a couple weeks ago. We had Caden on a few weeks before he enrolled on campus. And now we have him after year five on campus as an NFL draft riser. So we're investing in these guys. Some of them that we talk to, they're not going to be on campus a year from now. Some of them are going to be superstars in the NFL down the road. Uh, but right now we're just trying to kind of get a lay of the land with about 24 to 30 dudes. Daniel, anything else to add before we say goodbye? No, I'm I'm just looking forward to really going through this audio and putting whatever nuggets that we find uh, on, on the board. I, I think that that thread is going to be a, a really fun resource for our VIP subscribers. Check it out over at lions247.com. Right now you can get on board 30% off an annual VIP subscription. That's going to do it for myself, Mark Brennan, and Daniel Gallon. A packed episode, one of the, the longer episodes we've done exclusively just talking about this football team right now. Starting to set the stage a little bit for spring practices. This 2024 Penn State team getting a little bit more clarity at certain positions and some curveballs thrown our way even here on a Thursday. Uh, on behalf of this whole crew, thanks for tuning in and watching, listening, whatever you're tuning in uh, for the Lions247.com uh, and the Lions247 podcast. Take care, folks. I'm Tyler Donahue. We'll be back next week with two more episodes.